I was in ministry for, I think, close to 27 years before I knew about this situation the way I know it now. And I was officing next to a mental health therapist and we started to compare things. She was working in trauma and I was working in prayer ministry. And we started to dig into the roots of similar things. We would have common clients and we just could not nail down what we were trying to help them get through. And then one day she sent me this, um, it was like a PDF book she had found and it was on the victim spirit. And we both read it with our mouths open like, this is such a common problem in the people that we serve that it became, um, we ended up sharing it a lot with people because if they could focus on just the nature of this area, it helped them see many other things that they were unable to see at the time as to what was causing all these different problems socially, in their family, um, addiction, all of it seemed to be connecting into this area. And so a victim spirit is so incredibly common. I think all of us either have had some kind of um, situation with this, whether it's seasonal or some of us, it was a long duration. Sometimes entire family systems operate this way. Either way, it is so destructive and it is so anti-faith in Jesus Christ. It is an absolute work of the devil. So I want to try to put as much explanation to how this looks and what your response to it should be. But this would be those who wallow in depression, self-pity, self-rejection, and self-condemnation. People who just kind of stay in that mindset. They have a very difficult time forgiving themselves. They continually push themselves and they continually feel like they're failing to live up to expectations themselves or of others. And they suffer from continuous torment themselves and outside. They just are sponges for torment. And people who have these types of qualities often have a victim spirit. And the Webster Dictionary defines victim as a living being offered as a living sacrifice, an individual injured or killed by disease or accident, a person cheated, fooled, or injured, either a victim of circumstances or accident prone. And this victim spirit can show up in finances, any relationships, work, ministry, and it settles for less. It has little or no joy. It dishonors and disrespects the person that carries it. It never walks in the honor that God calls one to walk in because God has already placed a price on us, and that is we were worth Jesus to him. It doesn't even come close to recognizing that. A victim spirit is a way of looking at life that unknowingly attracts abuse and disrespect to you. It will also show these things in your life destruction it has an unconscious self-destructive nature to it and makes people be very accident prone it has a focus on injustice it's consistently finding that you are in situations where the rules are being violated at your expense and there's absolutely nothing you can do to change it it has a malpractice type appearance it if you're trying to pick someone to help you, any kind of professional, buying a car, buying a house, you will always end up with the most problematic choice, someone who's incompetent, there's some kind of professional flaw in them. It just draws that to you. It's devouring, it's constantly having people take advantage of you financially not being able to get a grip on your finances as a result because they're in disarray. You have constant emergencies that drain 
your bank account and keep you in debt. It also is a defilement. It makes you a target for sexual advances or inappropriate language, no matter how modestly you act or dress. And I, I that, that feels personal to me because I went through that personally and thought, why am I always being treated that way? And then I had to learn about this. It's been really eye-opening for me too, but I get asked by, I, in fact, just a woman this week, or was it last week where she said, why are men always hitting on me with very inappropriate language? She says, I'm on a ministry team. I'm out serving. I'm not causing this. Why do I get, always get treated like this? So I just said they can smell the weakness. They can smell the brokenness. And this is what they can smell is a victim spirit. Abuse, it has a habitual attraction to the wrong kind of relationships. So you just keep cycling in the same types of people. Like we were just talking about us having types. It will keep you stuck in a type that is messed up like you are. You don't want to be in a type that's not messed up because then you will feel rejected and victimized. You attract dishonor everywhere you go. People who are normally really gracious people with others are drawn into taking cheap shots at you. And, and you will notice that. These people are decent people. Why do they treat me that way? Other people will say, they're normally a really decent person. I don't know why they treat you that way. You dishonor and criticize yourself with a constant inner voice. When people around you are unhappy, you apologize for and own their pain, even though it has nothing to do with you and is not your fault. A victim mentality is when you blame everyone else for what is happening in your life. A victim mentality is when a person thinks that the future only holds more bad things for them. Nothing good is ever going to come to them. And Satan wants every single believer, those who follow Christ, to think that others cause the bad things in their life. Ultimately, he wants us to be bitter. He wants us to be unforgiving. He wants us to be resentful. He always wants us upset. And he wants us feeling like we can't do anything about it because it's in the control of other people and that our life is never going to change. It's always going to be like this. You will always be a victim. That's what he wants us to think. Nothing will ever be fair. Someone else is always going to get the promotion, the pretty spouse. And this is how someone with a victim mentality thinks. They literally believe lies and falsehoods all day long, always against them. Some of the emotions that are common with a victim spirit is the person who has it is you feel cheated and taken advantage of often. You feel lied to or violated often. You feel powerless or trapped to change any kind of outcomes. You feel angry. Sometimes you're angry at the predator, but oftentimes you're also angry at yourself for being a victim. You feel helpless to change any of that. You settle for much less than what God has promised you. He certainly would give you more, but you won't accept it. You will never walk in the dominion that God said you could walk in because you settle for mediocrity and you can end up angry, bitter, and full of resentment because you settle for mediocrity. Men are just as susceptible as women to this spirit and maybe more so. I would say in my experience, men have been far more aggressive in this spirit, spirit towards me than women have ever been. It is when a, when a man is operating in a victim spirit towards me, I actually can become afraid for my safety. So when men have a victim spirit, they invite disrespect and dishonor from others, and they find it almost impossible to love people as encouraged because they, when they feel disrespected or dishonored and they partner with a victim spirit, they become enraged. And then they pour out all of this rage on you. And half the time, you have no idea what even happened. In a normal setting, what happened would be nothing, but it was a perceived slight. 
and they became enraged. You are tapping into all of their previous rage over that very thing and they just dump the whole truckload on you. The other half of a victim spirit's job is to persuade the human victim that there's nothing that can be done or nothing that can be changed. They arrive at the conclusion that the problem is their fault and that they just need to lower their expectations in life even more and simply endure what comes their way. There are ready friends to join a victim spirit once it's in the house and a common first one is a predator spirit. It thrives on inflicting physical and emotional pain on others for the pleasure of the predator. The predator gets his greatest fulfillment out of the emotional pain he's causing by humiliating his victim. And it's important to understand that a person can be a victim and a predator at the same time. This would be common for children who are um, sexually abused, that they would become sexual abusers or fight that urge. Um, people who have been um, treated violently and aggressively at home as children become bullies on the playground. So they are victims in one setting, but they become the abuser and the predator in a different setting. Another is the poverty spirit, and this demon works primarily with a person's mindset to keep them from accessing and possessing what God would give to them. A person cannot accept or keep the good things that come to them when they are operating in a victim spirit joined up with a poverty spirit. They feel uncomfortable surpassing others. They pride themselves in their humility. They're usually simply unwilling to pay a price to achieve more. They are satisfied with far less than God's best for them, and they would rather make excuses about why they stay at that limited area than to actually succeed. Another is a spirit of jealousy. Many times it is small people who have not been willing to pray, pay the price to excel who become jealous of those who have paid the price. Their defense mechanism is to tear that person down, constantly try to absorb their what they have that this person wants, talk about them in ways that make people confused. They don't come directly out and slander them, but they say things that make people have doubt about this person. They choose not to grow into the spiritual stature or even work or whatever it is that they're jealous of. They aren't willing to put in the work, but they are very jealous of the person who has and feel entitled to what they have without having to put in the work. A very large number of the people of God actually fall into this category in many ways and they could be greatly used by God but they are being held captive by a victim demon. Their mindset revolves around the predator in their life. They simply don't even think in terms of being an independent person apart from this victim identity because they're always focused on the person who's aimed harm at them or caused this harm from early on, or somehow the trajectory of their life is this person's fault because of this thing that happened when I was eight, things like that. The way the victim spirit operates is to cause a person to shift their thinking from believing who they are in Christ, which is an overcomer who is seated in heavenly places, to believe that they have lost their standing in the heavenly places. And the result of someone falling prey to the victim spirit is a choice and a lifestyle of blaming others. They don't take responsibility for any of their own actions. And this mentality is like a drug. It will make them feel good for a little while before it destroys them completely. If you have a victim mentality, you will see that your entire life is about things happening to you. There's a combination of seeing most things in life as negative, beyond your control, and as something that you should be given sympathy for, treated with compassion, because you definitely deserve better than what you're getting. 
but the victim mentality is actually a way to avoid taking any responsibility for your own life. You choose to believe that you have no power and if you do that, you don't have to take any action. Nothing, you expect nothing from yourself. And all of this bad in your life is the fault of other people. They're the ones that are bad or wrong or mean and you are good and right and decent. Other people do bad things, your life suffers from the bad things they do. That's the belief system. There's a crucial distinction between being a victim and having a victim mentality because there is such a thing as innocent victims. There are people who suffer entirely because of another person's sin. And victim mentality often starts out this way. Oppressing innocent victims is absolutely condemned by God all throughout the Bible. Jesus himself was a recipient of human wickedness. He was the one of the greater stories of victims in the Bible. The New Testament shows also the unjust persecution that many Christians suffered. People can be innocent victims. And we all likely suffer unjust evil at the hands of others. Oftentimes, it's just part of being on this earth. But we have to become aware of moving from being an innocent victim to adopting a victim mentality. We need to affirm the reality of the suffering, but we do harm if we promote a victim mentality in ourselves or others. Psalms 1014 says, but you God see the trouble of the afflicted. Afflicted, you consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. The psalmist tells us to commit ourselves to God. He is not only able to help us as a victimized person, but someone who's been influenced by a victim mentality. He wants to help with that too. A victim mentality is not a biblical response. It is not acceptable to God and it is sin. There is no, never a time that God allows a victim mentality as a response to unjust suffering. The victim mentality distorts our view of reality and what is truly going on around us. And when we adopt a victim mentality, we tend to see things through a very negative lens. We magnify the bad things that happen to us, blame people and forces outside of our control, and we completely lose our perspective on reality because we don't see any of the good things. The glass is always empty. It blinds us to our own sin and our need for a savior. A victim mentality blows up the harm that's done to us. So whatever it was, could be a crossword set or an eye roll, it absolutely blows it up into a much bigger thing, but it also minimizes our own sinfulness. Our sin is nothing compared to what others have done to us. That's how we view life. We often have a part to play in many of the things that have been done to us. But a victim mentality tells a false story. It explains our situation so that the blame lies totally on the other people and circumstances. Therefore, it disempowers us. One of the most harmful impacts of a victim mentality is what it does to people who carry it around, who hold it. It removes nearly all of their initiative to improve their life and their situation. They lose the ability to positively change any of their circumstances they don't even see fit to better their lives. They feel hostage to their circumstances because they feel they did not cause them. It sucks the joy out of their life. A person with a victim mentality is not thankful for blessings. They don't even see that they have blessings. A victim mentality not only distorts and magnifies the difficulties, it also minimizes and hides any blessings. We might be in great pain as we do endure injustice. We might work to end such injustice, but we are to do this with hope, with love, not with anger and hatred towards those who we feel have hurt us. It damages relationships. It damages so many relationships. And people who have a victim mentality are so annoying to most people that they just don't want to be around them. They end up finding their own kind because people can't take all the 
ruminating. If you're in relationships with people that have a victim mentality, chances are they're never going to take responsibility for their actions in that relationship. If there's tension, something has happened in the relationship, it's going to be your fault, never theirs. If there's conflict, you're the one to blame. And they are not even going to be open to being challenged about that. They are innocent and you are guilty. And it becomes impossible to keep the relationship and your sanity. At the same time, you have to cave in and just give in, give in if you want to stay in their life. They won't accept any other option. In life, it rains on the just and the unjust, and we all will experience a lot of hurt in this life. It's just the nature of living. But the devil wants us to believe that most of the time when bad things happen to us, we have no control, we have no recourse, but we should be feeling sorry for ourselves and expecting others to do the same. God, however, is opposed to that. He wants us to have a totally different mindset. He wants overcomers. He wants us to believe and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He wants us to be more than a conqueror, he says, through Christ. He has made the way for it to happen. He wants us to choose it. He wants us to be free from anger, bitterness, revenge, and malice. He wants us to have his mind towards the pain that we're suffering. He does not want the hardships to absolutely destroy our life and our relationships. He wants us free, and he says we can overcome the victim mentality through Jesus Christ. Jesus came to show us how to overcome a victim mentality and to pave that path for us. He took the whips upon his back, it laid his back wide open, his beard was plucked out, he was spit on, they offered him vinegar to drink, they mocked him, they put a crown of thorns into his head, they hung him on a cross, and Jesus was completely innocent. The Bible says in him was found no deceit, no guile, no sin of any kind. If anyone had a right to have a victim mentality, it was definitely Jesus. But how would we look at Jesus if he was constantly complaining about how poorly he was treated, how wrong his trial was that caused his death, how everyone was making his life so difficult even from birth? And can you imagine if he rose from the dead and came out of the tomb swearing that he was going to get even with those who killed him. Even after his resurrection, what if he walked around feeling sorry for himself, that he was maimed from this death that he did not deserve? He was God. How could this happen? But no, at the very lowest moment of his life, he still refused to let his accusers and his murderers bring him down. 1 Peter 2, 22-23 says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus put himself in the hands of God who will judge fairly. And even while they were crucifying him, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He was not bitter about what happened and he showed us in many cases, especially this one, how to live out being victorious. And it says in the Bible that we have the power that raised Jesus from the dead at our disposal if we will ask for it. So it's definitely there. And if you choose not to utilize it, then you can continue to live in bondage to the devil. Even as a Christian, you can have everything robbed from you in this life that God wanted to bless you with because you choose to keep this mentality. And sadly, the reason many do keep it is because it has benefits. There are benefits to a victim mentality. People get attention, they get validation, they can always get good feelings from other people that are concerned about them, calling to check up on them trying to help them out that doesn't last for long you have to keep finding new people but it's worth 
worth it to them to find new people. And people learn how to play the victim. Sometimes they aren't even a victim. They just like the benefits of being a victim. They go around speaking of all their financial problems everywhere they go. They talk about all their problems. They have a story to tell and they know that this story will get them attention, validation, and oftentimes money or donations of other things that they want. They don't have to take risks. When you feel like a victim, you don't have to take action. You don't have to risk rejection or failure. Life is about taking risks, but not if you are a victim spirit. If you take a job, you risk being fired, you risk failure. It's easier to play the victim and let someone else take care of you and look after you. You don't have to take the heavy responsibility because taking responsibility can be hard work. Making difficult decisions is hard work. In the short term, it can feel like the easier choice to not take personal responsibility. It's just easier to be a victim. And to break out of that mentality, you have to give up the benefits. And many are not willing to do that because it appears to be too hard. They might experience loss when they let go of victim thinking because all the hours and the time they spent complaining and talking about all their problems, drawing attention to themselves, drawing people to them to help them, all of a sudden that's a big gap. Or how people have wronged you and how you should get some revenge or triumph over them. That is what a lot of people spend hours a day thinking on script writing, how to get even. So then you've got a big, big gap there too. Or you can fill your life with new thinking that may feel uncomfortable, but you no longer choose what's familiar as being everyone's victim, the thing you've been doing for years, instead of sitting in the house feeling sorry for yourself and like you're pathetic and should be treated like someone who's pathetic feeling like all your friends have left you, they don't invite you to anything. Instead, you choose to go out and make new friends. Instead of having your pity party, you decide to go out and serve others who are struggling for real. Instead of plotting revenge, you leave it in God's hands and you forgive and you walk away. You take responsibility for your own life at every level. No matter what may have caused you to fall into victim mentality thinking, it is absolutely only your responsibility to get out of it, no one else. You have to quit blaming others and you have to quit feeling sorry for yourself. The Bible is all about taking responsibility. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. And one thing God is not going to listen to is excuses here or in eternity. He hates complaining. Most miss the promised land because of their complaining. God hates excuses and he hates complaining. And we can harm others when we help them too much. Even people who are seemingly handicapped, if you help them too much, they can easily adopt a mentality that everything should be done for them when there are many things they could learn to do themselves. We need to stop complaining much of complaining by one who is constantly being a victim is simply to get attention. The Apostle Paul told those in Philippi, in Philippians 2.14, do all things without complaining and disputing. God does not like complainers. Instead, force yourself to count your blessings. Forgive people. Catherine Ponder says, when you hold resentment toward another, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. Forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and get you free. This is why hatred is so emotional, because you're stuck with them. You are, you are tied to that person. And as long as you don't forgive someone, you remain tied to that person. You are completely intimate with them. Your thoughts will return to that person who wronged you over what they said, did, didn't say, didn't do over and over and over for years and years and years until you let it go and forgive. The emotional link between the two of you is so strong 
and inflict so much suffering in you. It's so much inner turmoil. Most people, all the people around you are very aware that you are trapped in this cycle that you could easily get out of if you would forgive and release them. You would not be stuck. You could have a life. You could have a great life. You could completely move on. They would not be trapped in your head, reminding you that you're a nobody all day. Sometimes in life, we have to face pain and deal with it, like more frequently than not, because hurts and offenses certainly come. But you can be sure that when you forgive, God promises that you will find freedom from all the disappointments, all the unmet expectations. God has given us promises, and one is that when we forgive, when we bless our enemies, we will find freedom. God set it up that way. It always works. Hebrews 12, 12 through 15 says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I think people don't read the Bible. They do not realize that holiness is a mandate for heaven. If you do not focus on living in a holy state of life, you are not seeking heaven as your eternal home holiness is a requirement without holiness the bible says you will not see the lord see to it that no one falls short of the grace of god and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many so as soon as you feel that offense enter immediately bless forgive and bless Jesus asked a question to confront the victim mindset with the man, the lame man by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus immediately went to the heart of the issue. It may look like he wasn't caring. He didn't ask for his story. He didn't ask, how'd you get here? How long have you been here? He said, do you want to be made well? He cut right to the heart of the matter. Do you really want to be healed? Because Jesus knows many love the benefits of being sick. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me in John 5, 7. But that's not what Jesus asked him. He just wanted a yes or no. Do you want to be well? But the man didn't answer the question because it would either show that he wasn't trying to get healed and then he would look lazy and foolish. He just knew either way he answered that, it was going to be a trap that would expose him. So instead, he starts giving a list of reasons why he hasn't been in that pool in 38 years when he easily could have paid or bribed someone to just push him in. 38 years, he had plenty of opportunity. He could have said, the next time that angel comes, I'll pay you $1,000 because I'm going to get up and I'm going to go work and I'll pay you right away. But he didn't. Whatever it takes for a person who doesn't want to be a victim, they're going to make sure that somebody throws them in that water. 38 years he had to make that happen, but he didn't. That is why Jesus said, do you even want to be well? I've served the addicted many years. And there are legitimate financial and medical needs that require assistance. There are many cases where people need a handout to be able to get up or through. But when I was working in the jails um, it, a few years back, for a number of years, I would listen to the conversations and they would even tell me about these things where people were always applying for disability 
and they would coach each other on what exactly to say in that application so that you would be most likely approved. Because if you got the disability, then your rent's paid, you get medical insurance, you get food stamps, you basically get your life paid for. And so they're always teaching each other how to actually do that under a mental health diagnosis that they would then conjure up. They would, they would develop these symptoms and a lot of it included hearing voices, things like that. They coached each other on what would work. And I would tell them, so why, why would you want to do that though? Because if you get yourself labeled with that schizophrenic diagnosis, you're not gonna get any great jobs. <laughs> it's gonna be real hard for you because that's a pretty limited, it's gonna cause a lot of people to move past you and they were like, I don't care. Why would I even try to apply for a job if I could get disability? I said, well, for the rest of your life, you will have that diagnosis. What if someday you come to your senses and you decide, I don't want to be a slug. I really do want to be a good citizen, supporting my family, paying for my children. I can't even think of one person that said, oh, yeah, I don't want that. I cannot think of one. They help each other to write up what will get them the most money. They don't want to be healed. They actually want to be sicker. They actually come up with more symptoms to actually become sicker. They definitely don't want the healed life or they want to be healed, but they don't want the healed life. They want to be healed to go do more of what they wanna do but not what God wants them to do. And we do see that frequently too, where they're seeking the blessings, but not the blesser. They're seeking the gifts, but not the giver. And Jesus found this man later in the temple and he said to him, see, you have been made well, sin no more, or a worse thing is going to come upon you. In John 5, 14, Jesus was making sure this man knew that he healed him despite his sin issues, which he had, but if he didn't watch out for the sin issues and deal with that, that was gonna rise up again and he would end up even sicker than before. And I can't even tell you the thousands of times I have witnessed this very thing happen. I look at my own life and I was in the worst state of sin when God healed me. I was absolutely, well, close to death from all of my sin when God healed me. And I knew when I got up, literally stood up, that I am never, ever going back to the hell I just came out of. And I haven't because I was so sick of it. I was so tired. I was so tired. But many talk about, I've been narcan 15 times. I've been raced to the hospital and had my stomach pumped all these different times. It's almost like bragging rights, how close they came to death and how many times to return right back to the wickedness that put them there in the first place. They don't even have, it's, they're, it's part of a story, it's something for them to tell, but they don't recognize the price that was paid for that healing. It cost Jesus his life. It wasn't something to be flippantly throwing around and continuing to sin against him and remind him that you'd put him on that cross again if you had a chance, because you do. I'm shocked at how many return right back to their sin when they know they didn't deserve the healing that they got, and many don't get it. They don't get healed. They go straight to eternity from their first overdose. They don't get Narcan. They don't get someone saving their life. Those of us who are alive should never stop thanking God that he didn't allow us to die because we deserved it. This group 
all of us who are out in this know they end up much worse than they were and most will end up dying because they wasted their healing. And when we live as victims, one thing that is definitely in the house is unbelief. And unbelief is one of the most outrageous, offensive sins against God is to say, I don't believe what you're saying, God. It denies the possibility that our situation can be changed. This is people who say, I just don't believe it will happen for me. I believe it will happen for others, but I don't believe it will happen for me. Totally contradictory to the word of God and who the character of God is. I'm not going to say what that thing is, but we should never operate in unbelief from a personal standpoint of because of me, it won't happen. And like the man who was healed, we need to understand that we need to live healed and free, not continue as a victim of our sin and our bondage. A major part of the healing process involves renouncing your sin of being a victim and becoming victorious in all of the things that got you so sick to begin with. Freedom from the victim spirit changes you from being dominated to having dominion. You can enjoy the presence of God, something you couldn't even experience before. You leave joy everywhere you go. People know that you are free. You are completely light compared to the darkness that you used to be. People said to me when I first became healed and a Christian, they would say, she has eyes. I've never seen her eyes because I couldn't open them. They were so dark. I wore sunglasses all the time. People didn't even know what I looked like. Our anointing of joy is so great that it affects and infects all of those that we walk by. We're just like throwing flowers everywhere we go. Blessings pursue us and run us over and we see our cup already as full, but it's pouring over because we see more blessings, more blessings, like how we often say that here, like we can't even believe our lives. Honor naturally flows towards us in formal and informal settings. I can't even tell you, I don't know when it happened, but to look back and see that the dishonor, the people who did that, the people who continue to dishonor, I don't even have exposure to them. They're not even, they don't even have any way to communicate with me now. So. The life that God has brought me into, I don't fear the people I will run into. They're honorable. They're people who honor other people. They don't look to accuse. They don't look to stab you. They don't look to, they're honorable people. And I'm glad that I've watched that go all the way around so that I know exactly the impact of that on my life. It's amazing not walking around fearing what's gonna come around the corner and who and what's gonna be said. It's amazing. You realize that there's a debt of love that's unpayable. We cannot pay back everything, any of what God has given us. We finally take responsibility for ourselves and there's actually empowerment in that Being able to own your behavior, being able to actually own it and change it is a big deal. When you're a victim, you can't do anything. But when you can own it and say, well, that didn't work. That doesn't impact people very well. Make amends. Be quick to say, I'm sorry. And be quick to find a better way. Repent of living as a victim. We need to say, Jesus, forgive me for blaming all of my life on other people, for being selfish and self-centered in my life through what I say and what I do. We need to break up that lifestyle. And Jesus is the one that will give you the power to stop living as a victim. Or you can continue. 
continue to be a slave of Satan because that's what you are. Demonic spirits are telling you how to live your life, what to say, what to do, how to make others feel. You've turned everyone around you into a trash can. You need to say, I command this victim spirit to lead my life. I choose the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. I choose to be led by the Spirit of Christ in everything I do and say. Also very important is forgiving, forgiving parents, siblings, so much of this goes back to early life, especially those who violated you in some way. That is a very fast way for a victim spirit to get rooted. Forgive them simply because you don't want to stay tethered to them and become like them. Forgive them, those who force themselves on you, who hurt you by words or actions, forgive them. You may not have understood that, but now you do. Forgive them to get separated from that. And then don't blame them anymore for any of your choices or circumstances. Own your life. Break all ungodly soul ties with these spirits of others in your life with the same personality as a victim. Don't hang around with these people. It's like gossip. You hang around gossips, you gossip. You hang around complainers, you complain. If you hang around victims, you'll stay a victim. You need to say out loud, I break the ungodly soul tie that has dominated my thoughts with self-pity, self-rejection, self-condemnation, self-critical, self-judgment, self-hatred, and self-sabotage. I repent of letting all of these spirits in. I break all agreements with them. I cancel their right to control my thoughts in the name and blood of Jesus Christ, and I command them to leave. I put Jesus Christ between myself and these spirits, and I cancel their assignment today. We need to receive God's complete forgiveness for ourselves and release all self-judgment. So receive all forgiveness from God. He's got enough to cover every single sin till the end of your life. Receive it and release the judgment you have over yourself because it's, it's completely against what the cross was for, for you to go around with self-blame after the cross covered your sin. You do not punish yourself with unforgiveness because Jesus already did it. So if you're saying, I'm going to do it too, you're saying what Jesus did wasn't enough that is really offensive to God. See yourself through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Ask him to give you a humble view of yourself, a humble view that is an accurate view. In Philippians 2, 3 through 9, we're encouraged to follow the example that Jesus set for us so we can understand who we are in Christ, that we can accept our strengths and weaknesses. We don't need to punish ourselves. We are loved and accepted by God knowing all of our faults. We should not set unrealistic goals for ourselves when we already know that's not a strength in our life. High standards are good, but don't set them high in an area where you don't think you can accomplish them. Be reasonable with your own gifts and weaknesses. Ask God to wake you daily with wisdom and to open up your understanding, to hear and see the way he does and make a firm choice. Many don't do this. They choose to give their life to Jesus until they choose to go back to self. And then they choose to give their life to Jesus until they choose to go back to self. Many times, over and over, this is not the gospel. We don't get the right to do that. You either give your life to Jesus or you stay yourself. And if you go back and forth, that keeps you in control. You have not given your life to Jesus. You say, I choose to live my life as a child of the Most High God. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. I am not the tail. I am the head. I have the mind of Jesus Christ. I align my will to the will of God and I am an overcomer. So living with a victim spirit is optional because they can be identified and evicted. And obtaining freedom from this demon spirit will require 
God's power. You cannot do that in yourself. And God delights in showing up in power to free us. He's not interested in just helping us survive. He wants to partner with us in releasing his power into the world around us. And this mandate is about building up and expanding his kingdom. That's what we're for, not just survival. So we must, as an act of our will, choose to walk in the truth, even if it's very uncomfortable to start that. It takes very deliberate choices to override the mindset that was always being victimized. And this stronghold is generally stronger, actually, than the demons that it keeps. The, the demonic is easily evicted, but it's the mindset that has to be replaced with truth. So you really have to work to change your thoughts. And this mind renewal is accomplished through inner healing. That's something we do here. We're always very um, willing to help with that, a process of having the Holy Spirit show you where the lie is, give you the truth, and once you know the truth, you will be set free. Ezekiel 34, 28 through 29 says, And they shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the earth devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a planting of crops, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land or bear reproach of the nations any longer. Walking in freedom will change your life. Predators will pull back from you. People are safer when they're around you. Others protect and nurture you because they know you're worth it and you know you're worth it. Honor flows towards you in every way. You recognize that God, your Father, loves you for who you are and blesses you all through the day. You deeply desire greater power and anointing to make a difference in the lives around you for Jesus' sake. You embrace God's values and not the world's, and because of this, you are given power to change your entire culture. Your anointing is so infectious that it infects the land, the surroundings, and the people you're around, and joy continues to remain when you're gone from there. You seek God to find out from Him His design for your nature and His call for your life, and there is life-giving virtue in the words that you speak. I'm going to put a prayer and another and, and more information on the spirit in the comments. There's so much more to be said about this, but it's so critical that people self-assess and make sure that this work is destroyed in their life because it will completely block you from kingdom work. Precious Lord, I completely was buried in this. I don't even know for how long of my life, but way too long. And I feel that ignorance over this spirit really hurt me for a general, for a, quite a bit of time because this, I, I would have loved to have been free of it a lot sooner. So I ask that you would help others to have a clear yes to dethroning this mindset, this demon, to dethroning it and evicting it for the sake of the cross of Jesus Christ. You are so worthy of our worship. You have done far more for us than we could ever deserve. Our lives just to live in this country are miraculous. We have no room to complain. We all deserve nothing more from you. We didn't even deserve Jesus. So I ask that you forgive us, God, and you help us to stay fixated on the tr truth that we are so passionately loved by you and desired by you that any thought of us not having enough or not being enough is completely foolish. So burn it into our hearts how amazing our lives are and how awesome it is to be in relationship with the King of Kings 
and help us to throw off every weight, everything that hinders us and race forward as time draws to a close. We want to be of the greatest possible work to build heaven in these days. So help us, Jesus, to throw off our sin and our selfishness. We love you and we thank you, Jesus, for every single blessing. And I ask this in your precious name. Amen.